Good morning. It's good to be here, as, as was mentioned earlier by Tommy Herkin again, uh, for the third time. I was here in 2001 for six weeks and actually preached once during that time period. I uh, visited again in 2006 while I was here for, for a chaplain's conference on homiletics and world religions. And uh, now, once again, I have the privilege of being here. I was uh, at, at the, at the Army, U.S. Army Chaplain Colonel's course the last two weeks at Fort Jackson, and I mentioned to one of the other chaplain colonels that I was preaching, preaching at Leavenworth this Sunday, and he said, Really? What an honor! <laughs> and I said, I think so. <laughs> he thought I was preaching at the main post chapel, but I was preaching here, and, it's a, and it is indeed an honor to be here today uh, once more to speak to you from the Word of God. And as we looked at this passage in Luke chapter 7, where we'll spend uh, a good amount of our time, and excuse me, I need to remind if you didn't notice to mark hymn 343 for the invitation song. It won't be on the slides. You'll have to have to use the books. And the remember how to do that. And uh, <laughs> uh, all of us have become accustomed, I think, to using the slides. And it's a little hard sometimes to look down when we sing now. But the title of the song is one that resonates throughout the book of Luke. The way of the cross leads home. Because Jesus, in the book of Luke, is on a journey. And at the end of that journey, or near the end of that journey, is the cross. And then his burial, and his resurrection, and his ascension, which we sometimes forget. His ascension back to the Father is the culmination of his journey. But as Jesus makes this journey, he does it as one who believes himself. And he does it as one under authority. And as we read this passage in Luke chapter 7, we're going to notice that indeed, as the centurion comes to Jesus, he realizes that Jesus himself is one under authority, but one with authority. Because it is this Jesus, whom others note, speaks as no man ever has spoken before. Is this this Jesus, who speaks as one having authority, not as the scribes and the Pharisees? It is this Jesus who indeed can say to one, go, and he does it. Come, and he comes. But I want us to look first at the context in which this passage takes place. Because sometimes we look at a passage and we sort of zero in on a verse or, or a paragraph and we just drill down into it deeply and we forget what's going on around it. Have you ever known somebody that read a verse every day for inspiration? You know, you go, you find a verse, and, oh, that's a great verse. That picked me up for the, for the day. It's sort of like the man that read three verses every day, and one day he opened his Bible, put his finger down, and it said, Judas went out and hanged himself. He thought that's rather strange. I'm not sure how that applies to me. So he, he opened his Bible to another passage, put his finger down, and it said, Go thou and do likewise. <laughs> he thought, surely not, Lord. Third passage will make this clear. Whatever thou doest, do quickly. <laughs> the Bible really isn't meant to be handled quite that way. We are to look not only at a single verse, but at the verses around it. And the myth... And not only the verses around it, but the book that it is within. The testament within which it is. And the Bible as a whole. Those different contexts fill out the meaning 
of the passage that we are reading. At the end of Luke chapter 6, as Jesus concludes what is called by many the Sermon on the Plain, he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against the house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. And when the stream broke against it, immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not recognize in your actions and in your speech my authority? That's what he's asking there. Jesus is appealing to these people who claim to follow him to show that they recognize his authority in their speech, but also in what they do. And his words there in Luke lead immediately into this passage where a centurion comes to Jesus wanting his servant to be healed. Immediately, well, in this passage, Jesus heals a servant of the centurion. He encounters a military leader from another nation. That happens in the Old Testament too. Elisha encounters Naaman. In the next passage, Jesus raises a widow's son. Well, that happened in the Old Testament too. The prophet Elijah raised the son of the widow from Zarephath. And in the verses immediately after the healing of the widow's son in the book of Luke, fears, it says in chapter 7, verse 16, fear sees them all, and they glorify God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. A great prophet has arisen among us. What prompted those words? Well, Jesus has just had an encounter and, and a healing with a healing involved with a military official from another nation just like the prophet Elisha did. He's just healed a widow's son just like Elijah did. Those were great prophets in the minds of the, of the Israelite people, of the Jewish people. So they see now that Jesus is a great prophet like Elisha and Elijah. As we look in this passage too, we hear Jesus' words, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I tell you? And we hear the centurion who was not Jewish recognizing the authority of Jesus. And Jesus saying, I have not seen such faith as this even in Israel. By which token Jesus is saying the servants of God recognize his authority and by implication the authority of Jesus as well. But that's, that's the context of this, of this passage which also includes walking to the cross with Jesus. Because as Luke chapter 7 begins, Jesus is doing what? He's finished preaching the sermon on the plain and he enters the village of Capernaum. A rather small village on the western side of the Sea of Galilee. He's entering this village and Jesus as he teaches travels from village to village. Teaching in their synagogues, teaching in the public, in the public squares, teaching out in the fields, in the plain, on the mountains. 
Jesus is traveling. He's not traveling aimlessly in Luke. Luke chapter 9, 51 is sort of a focal point where it brings his destination into clear focus. Jesus sets his face resolutely toward Jerusalem. Jesus is not just running around. He's going somewhere. And he invites his disciples, and through Luke's words, recording of those words, he invites us to walk with him as he walks toward the cross. In Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, Jesus is going to tell his disciples, and again us, to take up your cross daily and follow me. And he doesn't mean that we need to construct a wooden cross and, and attach it to wheels and go down the street with our cross every day. He doesn't mean that we are to go buy a, a, metallic, a, a cross on a, on a necklace and bear our cross daily. But he means that we are to live our lives in a way that shows that we, like Jesus, recognize the authority of God. That we, like Jesus, believe that God will redeem his people. That we, like Jesus, are willing to suffer, to bear the consequences of that belief. At times we forget that there are consequences for believing in God. That there are consequences for obeying Jesus. Right now there's sort of a fluctuation in attitudes toward authority in our, in our culture. And we are occasionally now are seeing that we're having to make some choices. We're having to count the cost of being a Christian. We're having to decide, will I speak up? And if I speak up, how will I do it? Or will I act, will I act wisely, excuse me, wisely behind the scenes, be, as Jesus said, like a, like a fox, And serve Jesus in that way. We're having to walk to the cross. Begin to walk to the cross with Jesus. But that always, that always, even when we didn't think about it, has been the mission. To take up our cross daily and walk with Jesus. To think each day. What does it mean today for me to be a Christian? When I encounter a situation, a person in need, or a person I know has never really been confronted with, with the message of Jesus, what do I do? How do I take up my cross and walk with Jesus daily? What do I do when I hear about what Jesus can do for me? We have to walk recognizing the authority of Jesus. This is where that question that Jesus asked just before this passage comes into play. If you've been baptized, raise your hand. When you were baptized, what preceded that baptism? You confessed that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You said that. How is each day, can people see that clearly? Do your friends, do your neighbors, do your co-workers believe that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Do they see it? in your actions, do they hear it in your words? Do they even know that you're a disciple? 
I remember years ago I was a chaplain in the 101st Airborne Division at Fort Campbell. And there was a warrant officer with whom I worked with the congregation I went to most of the time in town. Uh, the Madison Street Church of Christ. And there was another warrant officer that worked with that another Church of Christ in town that I visited on occasion. And I got to be good friends with both these warrant officers who were both members of the church. The one at the other congregation was actually a deacon. And the one at the congregation where I attended was a Bible class teacher. They were both very active in the work, in the work of the church when gathered together. One day I, w- I ran into one of these warrant officers on post and it crossed my mind asking, do you know this other warrant officer? So and so. Oh yes, we work in the same office. How do you know him? Well, I know him, you know, because I go to Madison Street Church of Christ most of the time and he worships there too. He's a member of the church. And later I realized the other one didn't know he was either. It was mutual, mutual ignorance of each other's discipleship. We need to let people know what we believe. We need to let people know who we are. We may even discover, as these two did, who became, they were actually good friends. They were not just co-workers, they were good friends. But somehow this had never come up. But our friends need to know who we are. Maybe we need to remember who we are. And whose we are. We need to walk recognizing the authority of Jesus. And it's really amazing in this passage that that's precisely what this centurion does. The centurion who works for the Roman Empire. Who is not Jewish. Who does have high regard for the Jewish people. After all, he is assisted in having their synagogue built. Whether he donated the money or raised it or, or encouraged people to, to donate. He, his work resulted in their synagogue being built. He's a friend of them. But we need to walk recognize the authority of Jesus. I want to look at, I mentioned that Elisha had also encountered Naaman, who was a Syrian commander a higher ranking commander than this centurion who works for the Romans. But look at some similarities and some differences. 2 Kings chapter 5 is the other passage. We've heard heard the uh, Luke chapter 7 read to us already and thank you for reading that. But in 2 Kings chapter 5 beginning with verse 9 it says but when what had happened was that the servant girl has told her real, the ill commander who is her owner she's Jewish she's Jewish she's Israelite about the prophet Elisha who could heal him he has leprosy so he's a commander in the Syrian king's army so he tells his boss the king hey there's a prophet in Israel who can king me who can heal me chain of command going on here the king says, oh, I'll send a message to the king of Israel with you, with you. So he sends his commander, his sick commander, to the king of Israel with this message, heal my servant. And the king panics. says, who am I to heal your servant? Elisha hears about it and realizes the message was really meant for him. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots, his signs of power and wealth, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be removed, and you shall be clean. That sounds similar to something we say in the New Testament. 
Repent and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Well, Elisha, I'm not sorry, Naaman hears this. He says, wait a minute. He was angry. He says, behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? Couldn't I do it my way? In the rivers of Israel, which are much cleaner than the dirty waters of the Jordan. Imagine someone saying, I don't have to be immersed to be healed. And his servants say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If he had asked you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? Naaman apparently relished that kind of thing. Yes, he would have. Yes, he would have done some great thing if the men had been here. And he got the point. He went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself in it seven times and he was healed. Well, the centurion in Luke chapter 7 hears about this teacher who not only teaches, but he heals people of illnesses. His servant is ill. And it crosses his mind. This teacher, this prophet, can heal my servant. Well, we already saw the request for healing was sent to Israel's king. The centurion now, again, is not Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. And there were some, there's some cultural stuff going on here. Jewish people did not mix freely with Gentile people. They didn't go to their houses. They didn't eat the same food that they were eating. They didn't share glasses or they... There was washing of hands and such. If you came into contact with the Gentile, you were considered unclean. This centurion knew that. He was culturally aware of the people whose territory he was occupying. So he spoke. He sent a request... For, to Jesus for the healing of his servant through the elders of the Jewish people in Capernaum. And they, in turn, spoke up on his behalf and told Jesus why he should heal this person. Now, Naaman's response to the prophet was, I deserve better from the prophet. I deserve to be treated a different way. I deserve a better treatment. Even though the Jewish elders, in their approach to Jesus, say this man deserves to have his servant healed because he's helped us, he's good to us, he's helped build our temple, the centurion himself later sends a second message to Jesus directly. He says, I am not worthy. I am not worthy for you to come to my house. A little bit of a contrast now between the attitude of of Naaman and the attitude of the centurion. The servant still Naaman, do what Elisha says. And and Naaman listens to them and and after some resistance does it. The centurion says, I too am under authority. And I direct others. They do what I say. But I also receive direction from others and I do what they say is the implication there. So Jesus, say the word and heal me. It crossed my mind as I was looking at this that sometimes we may overlook something that the centurion is saying. He says, I too am under authority. And he ends up, say the word and heal. Have you ever wondered, how does he get from, 
I am under authority to say the word and heal. I am under authority, therefore I say, I say do this, and he does it. Well, if he says I'm under authority, he's recognizing that even though he's a commander, he's also commanded. There are people whose direction he obeys. He's a man under authority. But he says to Jesus, I too am under authority. Under whose authority was Jesus? That's what I think we, we skip here. Jesus too is under authority in this passage. And because Jesus, well, yeah, I'm going to skip, maybe skip a little bit here. Because Jesus is under authority, maybe the reason why he says, I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. Because he knows coming to his house will make Jesus ritually unclean as a Jewish man. Maybe what's there in the centurion's words. Jesus is under the authority of God and under the authority of God's law. At this time as an incarnated man. He's not just the son of God. He's the son of man. He's under the authority of the law of God. He's also under the authority of the Roman law that the centurion upholds. And the other little neat thing here is that this word for heal and the word for save in the original language are the same. Same word. Sozo. To save, to heal. Jesus saves our soul, but he also heals our soul. He saves souls here, but he also healed bodies. When he tells us to walk as he walked, we are to seek the salvation of souls, but also the healing of others. And the work that this congregation has done in reaching out to prisoners in years past, the work that you all are doing in reaching out to people in homeless shelters, is part of that mission of the healing of the body, but also the saving of the soul. We're called to walk with Jesus. A writer named Flannery O'Connor, decades ago, wrote a novel called Wise Blood. It was about a young man who's brought up, brought up by his grandmother to be a God-fearing young man. He reads his Bible regularly. Then World War I comes about and he's drafted. He packs his Bible in his suitcase. He's going to read it every day while he's deployed. Then it skips. He comes back from war and he has seen some horrible sights. He has seen some horrible sights. He has smelled some horrible smells. He has heard some horrible sounds. He's been traumatized. And his Bible that he was going to take out of his suitcase and his duffel bag, read every day, as he, when he comes back, is still firmly in the bottom of his suitcase. Because he's been shocked out of his faith. And he goes home. And while he was away at war, his grandmother has died and her house is deserted. His more, the moorings of his values have been taken away. He can't be reintegrated because what he'd be reintegrated into has been taken away. He goes into a village and he sees a street preacher with a young girl, a blind street preacher, talking about the church of Christ and the gospel of Christ and how they need to obey it. And by the way, don't... Donate some money. Give some money to this young girl here. And this young, traumatized soldier returning from war hears this message and he sees hypocrisy. He sees someone that though he's proclaiming the church of Christ is living in rebellion to Christ. And seeking his own gospel. 
it strikes him that what the world needs is integrity and honesty. And in his disturbed, traumatized mind, he configures this as that he needs to go out and start preaching the church without Christ. And the point that he's making is that when you go out and you encounter a situation, you need to react to it honestly. You need to be a person of integrity. You need to know who you are. The irony of it is, the more he tries to figure out who he really is and to be a man of integrity... He does some horrible acts, by the way, as he's doing, conducting this search. But the longer he does it, the more he comes to a point where he's denying himself. Where he's abhorring falsehood. Where he's doing things that we, we might call spiritual disciplines. To remind himself that he needs to be authentic. But what he's missed is that we find salvation when we walk as authentic people with Jesus. We're not saved because of our works, but we're saved because Jesus has made our, our lives real. He has made us real, and he has made what we do in response and gratitude to him, authentic. When we do them for him out of love and gratitude for what he has done. When we do them in recognition that he is Lord of our lives. The centurion, because he was a soldier, knew how to follow. Because he was a leader, he knew that Jesus could direct. He could recognize another leader. So, when we walk with Jesus, when we walk with Jesus to the cross, when we walk with Jesus recognizing his authority as his disciple. We have to follow him along the road that leads to his destiny. Because his destiny is also our destiny. Because we want to be with him. We want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. So as Jesus walks to the cross, as he goes past the cross to his grave and arises from his grave, and ascends to the Father. So we too walk toward the cross, and we see the demands, and we witness the potential suffering, and we, but we also recognize that this suffering, this cost, we do some quick calculations. It's worth it. So we die to hypocrisy. We die to our sin. We confess, I believe, Jesus, that you are Lord, and I'm going to do what you say. And being now dead, we are buried. As Naaman finally reluctantly did, we are buried in water. We are baptized, and we arise into a new life. If you've been baptized, remember how you felt when you came out of the baptistry? I remember. Wow. This is great. I'm forgiven. And you go out and you're going to do these great things for Jesus. We've got to remember that every day. Maybe we need to do a little videotape like in the movie 51st States where the woman on, at the end of the movie she can't remember what happened the previous day every morning.
So her husband has made a videotape with the events of her life reminding her who she is. And every morning when she wakes up, there's a, there's a sign on the video player saying, push this button, you, it will tell you who you are and, what, and who we are. Or words to that effect. Maybe we need a videotape like that, a video like that. So that we can walk with Jesus, so that we can take up our cross and walk with Jesus to the cross, so that we can walk recognizing the authority of Jesus all the way until we too ascend to the Father to be with him eternally. So this morning, where are you on the walk? Have you begun to walk? Or are you just hearing the call to take up your cross? And you're thinking, yes, I think I I will. Begin your walk this morning by walking down this aisle and confessing before these people that you're going to say no to rebellion against Jesus, that you're going to recognize his authority as your Savior, as your Lord, as the Son of God. And then, having died to that life, be buried, arise into a new life, and to begin to walk daily, carrying the cross of discipleship as you move toward being with Jesus and with God forevermore. Maybe along the way you've dro- you're a Christian and you've dropped your cross. It got too heavy. The pain was too great. There were too many distractions. Too much abuse, too much rejection, or maybe just too many things. There were just too much fun to do, and you see, and a lot more fun than carrying a cross. So you, you forgot, you lost your focus. But now your focus has come back, and you, you got to do. You want to say, "I'm Lord, I'm sorry," and you want to say to some of these people here, "I'm sorry." I want to start over. This is your chance too to come. Have us pray for you so that you can renew your walk with Jesus. Whichever is the case. Let's sing together. Let's walk together as we walk with faith under authority. As we Follow the way of the cross that leads home.